everybody out there in UK clan book land. I'm here with Rosamund Lupton to talk about our Thigson's nominated book, Three Hours. If you could tell us a bit about the plot, please, Ros. Okay, so uh, in the opening paragraph of the book, the headmaster of a liberal English school is shot and badly wounded. Two teenagers grab him and drag him into the school library and it doesn't have a lock, so they barricade it with books. And the novel then follows what happens over the next three hours. So you have the kids and teachers who are trapped inside school buildings. You have the parents gathering who are desperate for news. Um, and you have the police who are tasked with getting everyone out alive. Um, for the people trapped inside the school, it's very claustrophobic. Things are really closing around you and smells get more strong. Sounds get louder, especially the gunman in the corridor, his footsteps going up and down. But outside, this thing gets very big. So you have counter-terrorism officers joining the police. You have international news media joining the local press and social media catches fire. Um, it's set over three hours um, because I wanted the reader almost to be reading in real time to become like a part of the action. Um, and it's not like an American school shooting. It, it's not about carnage. It's about what has led to this extraordinary event and, and how people respond to it. Is, is there any books you would say that influenced the speed of it? Speed of it? Then, what, um, I, mean, I think a number of books. Um, there was a book by the mother of one of the shooters at Columbine that, that I read um, to get an insight into what that was like. Um, I think that a lot of non-fiction books, there's, there's two refugee characters in the book, um, so I let, read a lot of non-fiction about that. Um, I think we, we need to talk about Kevin. It was something that I enjoyed years and years ago. Um, and yeah. it stayed with me. And I think that this in a way is, it's not set over a lifetime like Kevin's, it's set over three hours and it's told from the people caught up in the attack rather than the perpetrators. So if you like, it's the, it's the mirror, but yes, I'm sure that book had an influence at some, at some part of me. Um, when you were coming up with the plot, um, what, what um, made you decide to set it in winter because Books are not very often set in winter as a as a plot point with snow and the weather. Yeah, I, I think like I, I think the, the idea of cold is almost being another adversary in the book. So it's it's snowing. It makes it much harder for the police marksmen who are trying to take out the terrorists because the visibility is so bad. It's really cold for people trapped outside, um, and it's dark. You know that thing when when snow falls, and it also blankets everything. It makes these the familiar very unfamiliar. And people get lost and i i like this idea of when you're in your normal school everything changes i wanted that kind of mirrored in the landscape that nothing looks as it normally does anymore and um, when when um you were doing the research to decide on the, the layout of how the school was going to look um what was, what was the influences for that I think I, yeah, I think I wanted a number of different buildings so that different stories happen. So you have a theatre building where kids are trapped and it's very secure. It's got no windows and it's very easy to lock the fire doors. It's very robust. So they're, they're, how they deal with this is very different from their friends who are in a building that's like the main school building. It's an old school um, and they're trapped with a, with a gunman inside the school. And then you've got a pottery room, which is a little old Victorian pottery room in the middle of the woods. And that for me was conjuring up things a bit like, you know, children's fairy stories, the sort of hor horrific Hansel and Gretel scenario of, of the witch in, in, in the little cottage in the woods. There's something quite dark about it. So I wanted to use those different locations um, to, to kind of tell different sides of a story. Uh, and there's an old shed um, where a little boy is hiding and he's alone. And I think just that that loneliness and the cold and the dark and he's afraid of the dark was another kind of experience of this. When you when you split the narratives in order for the story story to work, um, what which was the first story that you came up with, and um, did it influence the arc in the way you told it's it? It's really hard because I I kept thinking which is the one I should use as the kind of template, you know, for everything around it, and there wasn't one. They were all so equal. It was really difficult. So I I have two refugee brothers. Um, and the older one is the first person to realise something's really wrong because he recognises the sound of a bomb and no one really believes him. So he kind of starts the action by, by kind of understanding something's really wrong. Um, and then I had these kids in the library and what they're feeling, what they're going through. And there's a girl called Hannah, um, who I was following her thoughts about her father and about her boyfriend. 
Um, and then I was really interested in the police and what it's like to kind of come into this situation and how terrifying that must be, but the weight of that responsibility. Um, so I was kind of playing with all these different stories and then I just wrote them all separately, kind of how I wanted to be. And then I had to kind of try and put them together. So there wasn't one that dominated it for me. I, I think thematically it was probably um, the two refugees, partly because Rafi realising it's a bomb kind of sets the whole thing going, but also he's extremely brave um, for his little brother. So I, that, that kind of was the backbone, emotional backbone for me. Um, but the police, obviously, there's a lot of hopefully interesting uh, detective work going on as to who these, who the perpetrators are, uh, what they're going to do next and what the police can do about it. And so that plot part, if you like, in part two and three of the book had to be kind of, if you like, the skeleton of it, that, because they had to come up with certain things at certain times. It's a, it's a very different um, um, police procedural angle to cover. Um, we were talking before the interview about the research involved in that. Was it complicated? It was. And some of it was, was not at all, and that was really worrying. So there's the, 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 the dark net in the book and buying weapons on the dark net. And I just got a computer out of the loft, put a bit of tape over the camera and was on the dark net in about three minutes. And I thought any kid on a phone could do this in their bedroom. You know, it's really, really simple. Yeah. Um, so that was that was quite shocking, I think, to just think, oh, that's easy. Um, other stuff, obviously, the police procedural bit I wanted to get right. And I had a really good police advisor. He'd been a gold commander himself. So, and he's also really creative. So I could say, well, I really want this. And he would help me achieve that rather than going, you have to be joking. You know, that's not possible. So that was really helpful. Um, and you know a lot of it was on the net was really helpful um you know i could find out how easy it is to buy you know a bomb making manual for instance um surprisingly easy on amazon so yeah some of it was kind of horrifyingly easy which i wasn't expecting um but the police stuff i hope i worked really hard at it to get it right and that was with a police officer i couldn't have done it without him you um studied literature at university and uh, there's a play in the book which has had a lot of influence on on the book yeah and my sister just said it Macbeth. Um, why did you choose Macbeth for the play um i first want to say you don't need to know the play at all to to, to understand the book but it it's i think it's the most evil of shakespeare's plays you know there's a there's a child killed on stage which doesn't happen in any other play I've ever been to. In fact, my husband was at a performance where someone fainted when that happened because it was so realistic. So it's like, it's just this it's a naked evil that you're witnessing, violence against children, which is kind of what's happening at the school. And then it's looking at how that happens and why that happens. I was talking about the dark net. In Macbeth, the witches meet on the heath. In, in my book, you know, the, the baddies, if you like, meet on the dark net. So I thought there were interesting parallels because what, what my book's doing is also drawing on what Macbeth does, which says, what turns two people evil? You know, they're a deadly dyad. And, and that, I think that's true. I think the combination, a toxic pairing, was something I was exploring. So that's, that's why I chose that particular play. I mean, the poor drama teacher goes, oh, why didn't we try, choose Oliver? You know, something with lots of singing and dancing that we can do, because during, during the course of the siege, she decides to get the kids to carry on rehearsing because they've got to do something and she's trying to take their minds off it. But of course, it's actually really dark what they're rehearsing. And, and But the, the teenagers start to realise through their rehearsals, they come to a kind of better understanding what's happening to their school, if that's not too pretentious. But that's what I was aiming for. No, it, it, it worked because of, um, it helped with the dramatic tension of the book, making sure that all the characters are going through drama, even though, as you say, they they were more in a safer area than the rest of the school. Yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. If you're in a safe area, what do you do? And what do teachers do at that point? And I think you, you have to keep them occupied because they've got brothers and sisters and friends who are not safe. The, the, two, the two brother relationship and the, 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 the fact that they're refugees, um, did, uh, did um, that kind of arc change dramatically or, or did it kind of stay? the way you thought it was going to... I, I think it, it, it developed and also cut a lot. So so the refugee kids, they're, they're basically like 
you know, British kids. So they're listening to the same music, reading the same books, having the same jokes, you know, that's what they are, but they have this kind of understanding and knowledge and also have been through this trauma really. Um, so I was interested in, so to start with, I did a lot of backstory of all the stuff they'd been through. And I thought but it kind of weighed the book down. So I chose very small incidents from their journey to England to kind of highlight what, what they'd been through and, and the kind of strength of their relationship because Rafe was 14 when he brought his eight year old brother from Syria to England. Um, so yeah, I, I I think I cut more than I than, I, than, than any other characters, but hopefully what was left was was the, the best bit of like the highlights of, of that of that story. No, the little extracts seem to work that way, I think, because you could you could tell the the detail that you've gone into with the research of it. Yeah, it worked. Um, they had a strong relationship with their headmaster. Um, um, given given how his story starts and how 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 dramatic that bit is, um, mm. uh, what was what was the and it, what was, the, was that always the plan for that to be such a dramatic beginning or? I, I wrote that paragraph and I don't know where it came from. I wrote the first six pages of the book from sort of nowhere and they didn't change. So I just wrote them and sent, sent them off to my agent and said, what do you think? Because I just, it was completely different to what I'd done before. And then, yeah, I didn't, I didn't alter any of it. Um, so yeah, then I had to make it into a book. <laughs> Yeah, because it is. A, I was researching earlier, and there's a five five year gap between this book and all the others. Um, I'm just curious as to um, whether that was down to the, the length of time it took the book to be written, or uh, it was. Yeah, it was a combination: taking time to write it and then taking time to publish it. Yeah. So you know, they kept getting postponed. Um, then it was published during the pandemic, so that was that was a bad, a bad yeah. choice. Um, but yeah, it was it was me being slow. I am a slow writer or a slow researcher and writer. And I, as I, I think we were saying before before this started, that I do so many drafts. I mean, I really do yeah. ludicrous number of drafts. So I think I had um, the piles of paper were higher than my desk of just this, you know, stuff I'd I'd kind of thrown out. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've probably done 30, 40 drafts of this book. Um, well, there's nothing, yeah, nothing wrong with that. It's, uh, it shows in the um, amount, amount that you've, how, how tight the book is. I hope so. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, when, when you were deciding what to, what to cut, um, there must have been um, lots of little stories because there's lots of characters in the book. Are there any characters that you cut out completely that don't appear in the book yeah. at all? Yeah, there was one, there's one that never appeared in the book. He was a PE teacher. I had a PE teacher, gym teacher, up on a on a sort of ropes course, thinking about his relationship and how he wanted to break up with his girlfriend because she was so, you know, mean to him all the time. And that and I really liked him. I just thought, and this kind of but he had to go, it was one character too many. And then other times a character would pop up. So there's a character called Frank in the library. So all these kids are locked down in the library and they're all scared and some are being brave and Frank doesn't feel he's very brave. And I don't know where he came from at all, but I really liked him because I felt, yes, I completely understand where Frank's coming from. He's not that brave, but he's trying really hard. And he ends up being really decent and honorable. Um, so he kind of crept in, but yeah, the PE teacher I was sad to lose. And there were other characters that I cut as well, but he's the one that I was saddest to cut. Bravery is a big influence in the in the book. Um, uh, given that a lot of the characters are children, how how did you get into the mind of a brave child for the for the story? I was kind of lucky that my um, I got this done, and while I was writing it, this they were teenagers, yeah. so I was around a lot of kids uh, a lot of the time. Um, and so it, that was helpful. I could kind of know where their heads were at. Um, I think I cleaned up the language quite a bit from what it would probably be authentically. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of, the eight-year-old boy was, was you know, because I know about eight-year-old boys, you know, when they're scared from my own children. So I, I drew on that. The, um, when you were looking at the um, the terrorist angle and the, the weapons and things, um, how, how, um, how um, hard was that? Because... Um, there was a lot of like 
little kind of um, traps and things for the, going out in the snow and the, the, the weapons and things were a bit more unusual to what I'm used to because because it's not just it's not just guns and stuff. There's a lot more to it. Yeah, I mean, I was, it, yeah, and they have semi-automatics um, but with converters, and I, it was really worrying doing it because when I first started writing it, it I was guessing at stuff, and then there'd be some terrible event in the states. I was like, oh my god, that's that's actually happened. You know, that was a site I went onto and had a look, and now someone's actually gone and done it. So it was quite frightening, actually, um, that you're writing fiction. And you're thinking, will anyone believe this? And when I started writing, you know, far right white supremacy was just like, I thought, well, will people really believe that's a thing? Um, and then unfortunately, it really became a thing. So, you know, it was odd writing stuff as, as I was writing it. Um, so the Christchurch massacre happened, for instance, while I was writing the book in New Zealand. Um, and various tabloid newspapers filmed it and had it had the webcam footage on their sites. And that kind of stuff. So I wasn't expecting that. So I, was, I felt that, um, you know, I was writing what was actually happening in the world rather than when I started where it was purely fiction. When you're talking about the coverage of the um, of the um, siege in the school, uh, did that influence the journalism that you put in the book? How do you mean? Like, did that influence the 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 story that, you know, because you had like, um, um, you covered newspaper bits. And yeah, no, I was, I was just quite, I was looking at, um, you know, hate speech really and hate crime. And I just looked at all these headlines that had been running. Um, and I was really struck that when you put them all together, they didn't seem so bad one by one, um, but you put them all together and, it was quite shocking because they were, you know, I thought, yes, a teenager who's vulnerable could be whipped up by these headlines. And a lot of them were retracted and were complete nonsense. You know, and that, that was across the board. That was the Times, the Mail, the Sun, the Telegraph. You know, it was across the board. There were, there were false stories being printed. So I was looking at those and looking at what the impact might be. Um, so, for instance, Muslims Bang Christmas was actually a restaurant that changed a menu from Christmas menu to festive menu. And that came as Muslims Ban Christmas. So it's that kind of stuff where you just take something and you kind of make it really big. Um, so yeah, I was I was interested in what that does to people's perceptions um, of, you know, in this case, Muslim people. There's lots of different people within the school that would have had different perceptions on. Um, with a school that has so many different kind of national nationalities in it, was. Was there, was there any kind of school that you modelled it on or was that just a fiction one you made up? Yeah, no, I did model it on a school and I can't really say which school because I'm sure they'd be upset, but no, it was absolutely modelled on a real school and a, a very inspirational headmaster and inspirational school. So, yeah, a progressive school. Um, so it's it's, it's modelled on that because um, I, I my kids went there and it was a very different kind of schooling, you know, no uniforms and actually the teachers were called by their first name. Um, very few rules and no shouting, that kind of thing. Well, it seemed to be um, a pretty unique um, landscape for the school to be set on with the uh, with the beaches and the and the the, the bit and the land it was put around. Um, yeah, yeah. When, when you're looking for the kids and teachers to escape, did that? Was uh, how much of that was was that was that all fictional as well? Or? Yeah, no, I, I really wanted. You're quite right. I, I wanted um, the junior school shelter on the beach under the cliffs and wait for boats to rescue them. And I I wanted that image. Um, partly, it, it was just an interesting image to me, and, and it's quite dramatic because they have to hide till they get rescued. And I also wanted the woods, if you like, at the top of the cliff, uh, where there are other children hiding and possibly a third terrorist. So. And I wanted to, I think woods are very evocative for British people. I think we're all, well, I'm always a bit scared of woods, um, partly because of fairy stories, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel and that kind of thing. So I wanted the woods and I wanted the beach. So that's why it's set where it is in Somerset. 
the school had um, a wide range of children and it had the, the pottery teacher with the, the little kids. Um, was, was it different to work on their, their plot lines and did you, did you do it at separate times? They were the easiest. They were the easiest. And I, I wrote the teacher um, in one go, and I don't think I ever changed it. I sort of saw her, and I saw those kids right from the beginning, exactly. And and in a way, they're they're static. They're in this pottery room, and they have to hide under the tables. And they're making they pretend she says we're playing house, so they're playing a game. Well, she's trying, and she's desperately trying to cover the windows with clay um, to stop flying glass, and kind of sees the gunman out in the woods aiming a gun at her. And I, I think it was, it's almost that they're static for most of the book. That's that's the situation they're in. Um, but obviously at the end, it's quite dramatic and at the beginning, but then they're stuck there with her being very brave um, and trying to keep the children not knowing what's going on. Uh, as you say, uh, bravery is quite um, an important element to it, but bravery in uh, like teenage relationships and how, how uh, you realise something um, throughout the book. Because the arc of the book is quite um, dramatic for everyone involved. There's a lot, a lot of changes. Yeah. And I, I, I think one of the things I was interested about was when you're really afraid, what it reveals about yourself and what it reveals about how you feel about someone else. So there's a mother whose teenage son is missing and she's terrified. And she realises, she always thought that her love for him was really possessive. That she didn't want him to grow up, she didn't want him to have a girlfriend, she didn't want him to go to university. And then this happens and she realises that's exactly what she wants for him. She wants him to grow up and is desperate that maybe he won't. Um, there's a teenage girl who, in Hannah, in the library, and she thought her father, who's, she's, who's a single parent, and she were growing apart because she's a teenager now. And she realises during this that she's got her dad's voice in her head. And actually, in the important things, they're really still very close. Um, so there's a a teacher who suffered from depression and thinks that he's quite cowardly and during this he realizes that actually to protect the kids he'll be really brave so I was interested in in sort of looking at what being in that situation does to you and how you feel about the people closest to you or the people you're responsible for when when you're looking at um, the um, parents relationship with the with the kids and the, their they're separated into um, the legislature outside of the school, um, away from everything. Um, were you, uh, did that kind of always be the case or did they come in later? They were later, actually. They, they were a bit later. Um, I mean, I knew kind of what would be happening, but they were probably the, almost the last strand that I wrote because they're reactive. You know, they're not actually doing very much. Um, I mean, it's that horrific situation I think any parent dreads. And it's partly the stasis and the fact you can't do anything. So I have one, they all drive frantically to the school, one dad's still in pyjamas, you know, clamouring to get in. And they're not allowed in and they have to go and wait in a leisure centre, which I think is hard. Um, and then the kids that have been rescued, they have, they fax over the names and the kids have written them in their own handwriting, which is something that happened in a, in a real kind of incident. Um, so yeah, the, the parents were later addition because they weren't really, in plot terms, doing very much. With, with um, the um, police as well, um, was the police, were the police always gonna, um, I think that they were like the, they kind of helped the plot in the middle of the book, but um, the characters in the, in the school were, the main ones for me. Yeah. So the police characters, how important were they for the plot? So I, I wrote part one, which is just the kids in the school and the headmaster being shot, and it's all very much the, the central characters in the school. And then part two opens with the helicopter arriving with the police officer who's kind of in charge. And I wanted that change of pace, you know, and that outsider influence. I thought we've been inside the school, we've seen what's going on, and now I want the police to have a different angle and different view. And we want them, we really want them to get these kids and teachers out alive. So I thought by that point, we really have a vested interest. But I wanted to show the victims first as fully rounded characters and people rather than as sort of pawns of a plot. 
which I think if I brought the police in earlier, they might have been. So then the police and the carrots interact during the rest of, of the book. Were there any um, uh, authors that you've read that would say that um, gave you the influence for that kind of relationship between the character and the, and the police? Because it's very different to the norm. I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure subliminally there must be, but I, I don't know exactly who um, yeah. I've read. I have to come clean and say I'm not a huge crime fiction reader. I mean, I love it and I've read some, but I'm not nearly as knowledgeable as you are, for instance, about it. So probably I read something which I've long forgotten, but it lodged in my mind. Given that, you've, um, that you say you're not, you're not a big um, crime reader, what else do you read that might have influenced? Well, I, I think it's some crime. So, I mean, I really yeah. like Jane Harper and I, and I really like, you know, um, all sorts of Chris Whitaker's book, Kate Atkinson, I really like. Um, so I read all sorts of stuff. I read a lot of nonfiction as well. I think that that influences me quite a bit and did for this book. Um, I, I was quite, um, I was reading a lot about Trump while I was writing the book. I was fascinated by what was going on in America. Yeah. Um, but I think, I like Kate Atkinson because she's so, so it, there's so much energy in her writing, which I really like. And then there's a really good friend of mine called Kate London, um, who is an ex-Met detective, who's turned novelist. Um, and I really like her books because she really knows what she's talking about. So she's written a book called Postmortem, and it's a trilogy of books set in, in London, which is being adapted for ITV at the moment. Um, but I think my, possibly my friendship with her was more instructive to my writing than necessarily her books, because I would talk to her about her work. How, how how important uh, would you say that um, yeah this how important would you say that the um, the relationship to other writers is um, for you when you're not when when you're not writing because I find it a very lonely not to talk to people. Yeah, I think it's absolutely vital um, to have author friends or writer friends because you can say something and they will understand it in a way that maybe, you know, family and friends find more difficult. So, you know, if you say I'm writing a nine or 11 point of view fiction and I'm completely lost the plot. And if, if you know, a fellow writer will go, oh my God, I know it's awful. <laughs> I've tried that or I'm doing that and it's so difficult. Um, and they won't just go, oh, I'm sure you'll be fine, which is what other friends might say. Or you'll get a really shabby review when you're feeling low and you can say to a friend, I've just got this, you know, Amazon, something which you, you know, and they can go, yeah, well, I got this and they can top it and make it worse. And you can have a little competition about the worst yeah. reviews you've ever got and make it funny. You know, that kind of thing. Um, it's it's really nice. I, must admit, I do enjoy uh, listening to the one star reviews on um, some of the podcasts that that. Uh, yeah. some of the things that come out with um, what um, would you say is the um, most most important thing you learned about your style through this book I think um, it's the, the thing that I really enjoyed with this book was, was the variety of voices I think before this book I'd kept very close to or close-ish to my own kind of voice and knowledge um, and this was the first time that I'd allowed what would have been minor characters in other books to come to the forefront. And it was really liberating and, and exciting to write. I, I think I've reached my limit on how complicated a plot can be. It, it really did my head in writing three hours and trying to make it all work. So I think I've pushed that boundary as far as I can now. I don't think I'd ever try and get do anything cleverer than that. Who who was your first readers given that it was so complicated? Um, I have a, a really lovely agent uh, called Felicity Blunt, and as I say, she read those first pages and sent me an email going, hey, "It's brilliant!" You know, well, no, she phoned me actually, which is even better. The phone goes, you know, and she's really good at editing. She's really good. She, at one point, she said, "What what about that class in the English classroom? What's happened to them?" And I'm like, oh, "God, I'd completely forgotten about them. I've got all these other characters. I've got a whole class of kids. I haven't." kind of written about so you know she's 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 very creative that way and I think you need that you need someone just to point out the you know the obvious that you've managed and you're you know trying to do clever things you've completely forgotten something really obvious um 
and my sons read it and which was really helpful for three hours because they're teenagers so they could really point me in the right direction of what teenagers were actually like rather than what I might think they're like um and yeah and then you know then it goes to publishers and and my sister she always reads what I write she she's normally my first reader what did you first what what did you first read as a child given that a lot of the plot is in actually in the school library sorry can you say that again I'm a bit deaf what what, what did you first read as a child given the plot oh, a lot of the plot know, is in I the think, school library? <laughs> I think my favorite book was a book of jokes I can remember getting it out of the library over and over and I must have bored everybody but I remember thinking this is amazing you can read a joke and then tell people and they laugh um I read everything and anything. I mean, I, I just was a voracious reader. I would get my six books out of the library and take them back every week as a really young child. I learned to read very young. And I think that was, you know, that was started me off. Um, so, yeah, I read, I mean, I read rubbishy books as well. I mean, you know, people are really snooty about Enid Blyton, for instance. I loved them. Pony books, loved them. You know, I, I wouldn't really, and I still don't, you know, Kind of make a distinction between good books and bad books or trashy books i think you know a well-written book is a well-written book um there were so many books that you got the kids to use as like safety safety barriers in the library um what what book what book did you always go back to and reread um uh, i think i probably I'm not I'm not going to say middle March because I just started that again and I'm thinking really I don't think I want to read it again. Um, I read things like Milan Kundra and Love and the Time of Cholera. I read all sorts of things that are nothing like the stuff I write. So I really like Anne Patchett because I think she does really beautiful stuff. There's an author called Rosamund Lehman, which I like because it sounds like me, but I studied her as a teenager and she's an Edwardian novelist. I mean, she's got absolutely nothing to do with my life, but her descriptions are so beautiful and her characterization is so subtle uh, so i'll read something like that something that's not mainstream necessarily or or anything to do with what i'm writing but somehow it, it helps um w w when talking about descriptions are you, were you influenced at all by uh, any cinematic descriptions about tv or anything? i wrote a book um called the quality of silence um so not three hours and that was set in alaska and I was really influenced by wildlife documentaries of just, you know, seeing it on the telly and thinking, oh, wow, that looks incredible. And then I wrote it and everyone went, oh, that's Ice Road Truckers. So then I watched Ice Road Truckers. I thought, oh, God, it is. It really is. So, but three hours, no, I can't. I think the snow is very evocative for me. I do think there's something about snow and cold. And I think it's about certainly for a thriller. I just like as a reader being in a snowy, cold, hostile place for a thriller. I think there's something about it that I just like. Maybe it's because you can be warm while your characters aren't. Is, yeah, it really did, really did work uh, with the snow. Um, if um, you were to go anywhere in the world and choose a kind of weather, weather that you could write about again, where, where, would, where would you go? Oh, that's really interesting. I'd go to Antarctica, I think. Yeah, I've been I've been to the Arctic Circle for one book, so I'd go to Antarctica. I would love to do that um, and write a book there. I, there's a book called Where Do You Go, Bernadette, which was a it's a comedy book, but it's brilliant. And that's actually the woman goes off down onto Antarctica Ar Antarctic cruise, and I've always thought that looked rather brilliant. What What is it that you um? like about the comedy things because i think comedy provides a break in tension and is there anywhere in your book that you would say that you use a comedy element in i don't, i probably should have done because i think they really could deserve a break there isn't any comedy i don't think in three hours or there's there's a love story which is which is kind of incongruous and i really like because it's so incongruous there's kind of joy um but i don't think there's enough comedy i think my first book um is is it basically is a sister talking to her little sister and there, there are kind of in jokes that they have which I liked um, but I definitely think I need to brush up my comedy I, I was a script writer for years and I actually did write a couple of comedies and I think there's something similar to thriller writing actually because you, your comedy is you have to be really good at your plotting I think for, to pull it off for tv or, or for film so it's not a million miles away um you, 
uh, your first book came out in 2011. You uh, finished your degree in uh, 1986. And so I was really curious as to what, what you did before you became a writer because it, that can often influence what people write about. Yeah, no, I, I, I did a variety of jobs um, and then graphic design and all sorts of, I mean, studio manager, I, I, I just wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Or, And then I was made redundant, which was good because I wrote and I was really bad and I wanted to write for telly and I just got rejection after rejection quite rightly because I was really bad and it took me about five years of writing and then I got stuff on the telly. Um, and I did that for several years and then I had children and script writing didn't really fit and also my brain was a mush I mean I just so then I started writing books um given that given that um you um were very very popular with the Richard and Judy um book group um what um what was it about then what was it about that show that made you decide to apply for for their book group or Oh, well, my first book. well, actually, what it was, it was the first book that they did with W. H. Smiths, their new book club, and Sister. They chose Sister, and I think my very brilliant editor at the time just gave everyone at Smith's head office a copy of the book, and they all read it, and then they told Rich and Judy it was great. So that's how that happened, because yeah. um, I was with quite a small publisher at the time. So yeah, it was genius of her. It was really great, and I, I then had another book with them as well. Um, and they were really, I mean, they just propelled the book into a different stratosphere from where it would have been had they not chosen it. Um, we've, we've been talking about Theakston's, um before, and you're saying that you've not been yet. What are you looking forward to about going? Um, well, I think we really, I did a really nice panel interview with the other five shortlisted books, and they were really great people. You know to chat to um so i'm looking forward to actually meeting and talking um to the other authors there and and also meeting some readers i mean this year as i said i was published in a pandemic and i haven't been to a real event i've been to i think one between lockdowns that was very small so it'd be really nice to actually meet readers again what well, what was it like um being published in a pandemic and was it, was it changed uh, I think it was so the hardback was was pre-pandemic came out but the paperback was the second lockdown or the, I mean, I've lost track of the lockdowns but it came out as we locked down again and it was really gutting because I had this lovely paperback covered in great things and no one was going to see it so it was it was you know I always say disappointment is the most underrated emotion but it was bitterly disappointing um, and I really feel, I mean, in a way for me, at least I'm relatively established. So, but I think for you know, debut authors, it must have been particularly hard. But yeah, it was rubbish. It was really horrible. horrible. Uh, I must admit, I did, I was one of, um, uh, I did read your book early because it was in December of last year, which is like, um, thanks to an email from you publishers. So that, that really, um, came, came out well because I, I, I wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for the advertising so give them a clap on the back for that it's yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what was it about um, releasing it at, at, right on that time that they, they and you thought it might, that might be beneficial was it Oh, it's all to do with which promotions you will get into in Waterstones or Smiths. And then that all, you know, went by the by because of lockdown. So it's all to do yeah. with, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's it's a marketing. Um, but also, if you've got a very snowy book with a snowy cover, you don't yeah. really want it publishing in July, which has happened to one of my books. <laughs> and you don't want a hardback in July. You want you want your paperback in in sort of November, really. Yeah, it, it um, it what you know when you they come out at different times of year. Just say one of your other books came out. Did that make any kind of difference to how you see a book? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think my first book had a very snowy cover and came out um, in the winter, and we had we didn't have a launch party, but then 
my husband and I had a party in the snow and it snowed and it all just felt of a piece. It was really nice. So that's kind of locked in my head as a kind of very snowy book. But then the other two, not really. Um, so it feels really funny. It feels very distant as you write another book. The others sort of feel more distant. Um, now that now that it's um, a long time since this came out and that the award, award systems, uh, are, what's the next book um, going to be on, and uh, when are we likely to see it? Ooh, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't really talk about it because if I talk about it, I'll never write it. That's the thing. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell you when it's when it's, when there's a, a date or anything I can actually talk about. Yeah, fair enough. Because now, now you remember the group issue. You, you know, you yeah. just just give us a just give exactly. us a heads up when it's I'm coming. Now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I'll tell you. Yeah. Um, what? Um, what do you discuss with them um, like have you been a member of any group like this before and what what have you discussed with groups if you have i have done quite a few book groups not none as none as kind of big as yours but i it depends who they are I and mean, i did a group and they all they were all parents of teenagers and they were all completely horrified and so it was all about how likely is it and all that kind of stuff um i've done but groups of mixed ages and very different, you know, people have very, have very different views on things. Um, so it it's it's really interesting who, I think because there's so many characters, you find that readers tend to identify or particularly like or relate to a different character, a certain character, um, and that can be quite variable. As, as a writer as of, the, of this book, what would you say is the character that you relate to and enjoy as much? Is, is the one you enjoy? Uh, I think I'm really fond of all of them. It's really difficult. It's like a favourite child. I, I I, mean, I found Beth the hardest to write and I found her the hardest to edit. And, and she's the mother whose son is missing. Um, I, I like writing Rafi and Bazzi. I just really did. I really liked them. Um, and I like writing the love story because it was kind of a relief in the middle of all this horror. Uh, these two teenagers discovering they were in love with each other was kind of mad, but also rather wonderful. I like the drama teacher um, because she's slightly, slightly mad, um, but I think rather courageous, and she's kind of discovering that as she goes along. If if, if you were going to write in a different genre, what would it be? Oh God, I, do you know I have a real problem with genre because everyone says, oh, "What genre are you?" And I think, well, I I kind of write the book, and then people say, "Oh, it's thriller, or it's literary thriller, or it's crime, or it's you know," and there's so many subdivisions. So I don't set out to write in a particular genre. Um, I set out just, just because I, I have a story and characters and that's what I tell. And to start with publishers would be really upset and you know, we have to fit it into a certain genre. Um, but I, I think readers are quite good at, at kind of not minding if it doesn't slot really neatly into one thing. Yeah, because I was just thinking that because we were discussing we begin at the end before mm -hmm. the interview. What, um, what was it about that book that appealed to you and is it, as you're reading it? I think it's it's there's some wonderful characters um, and it's really character driven and it's really beautifully written. So I would say that's a non-genre book. You know, it's a great crime thriller book, but it's also a really, you know, it's a literary book or it's a, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I, I think we have quite artificial kind of barriers around certain types of book. And then some people break them, like like Chris Whitaker. Uh, as as the audience will know, I, I um, read audio books uh, for my reviews. Uh, we were discussing the audio book before the interview. You said you were telling me that you heard part of it. What? Well, how do you how do you feel about how the audio book came? About? Yeah, no, I mean, the audio book. I I heard the beginning, and and it was so brilliant, and it's narrated by Gemma Whelan, who was in Game of Thrones, and she's fantastic. And I heard it, and it's really odd hearing someone read your words and bringing something else to it. It's it's fantastic, um, and also it slows down because when I'm reading my book, I tend to you know speed read to some extent. I'm looking for the problem or the issue or whatever it is. And so it's really nice just to hear. And one day I'll sit and listen to the whole thing, but I'm too close to it now. I don't think I could listen to the whole thing now. I think it because of the way that the, 
plot lines that I laid out and the, the number of different stories in it. The audio book really does do it a lot of um, favours because it kind of like allows you to bring the story together in the way that you you would probably have envisioned it. So yeah, it works. Yeah. I know she said she she was, you know, sobbing actually the last paragraph about five times, I think. <laughs> um, so she's a very empathetic reader. Um, what would you say um, is is um, a bit about not not just your book, but the, the thing that makes you feel emotional when you're reading? I think it's probably I do think siblings do it for me or you know, a parent-child relationship, something that that you just think, oh, that that sense of, you know, responsibility and protectiveness for somebody, that really gets me. Um, I write about it in three hours, because Whitaker's got it in his book. I think a lot of books have it at their heart is a relationship between two people where one person will is desperately trying to save or help someone else. I think it's very powerful. Um, if you were to turn it, ask for it to be made on TV or and who would you, who would you put in the role for that? The two brothers or anything? Got an I, d I just don't know. I mean, the thing is, I have to be really careful when I'm writing not to think about anybody because then I get quite lazy and I just think, well, the reader can imagine them, you know. So I kind of yeah. create people that I absolutely can't imagine ever being cast, you know, an actor ever playing them, and then hopefully one day they will be and they'll be fantastic. But it's not something I've ever thought of. Um. Have you, did you ever do that with the other book? Because you with, with you working in TV before writing? Yeah, no, I didn't. I mean, the reason I stopped writing TV um, was partly because a director said to me, you write much too much stage direction. I want a script, not a novel. And I did think, actually, I'm trying to kind of write a novel here. So I'll actually go and write it. Um, so my first book was Started Off Life, really, as a screenplay. So and then I, I was writing The Quality of Silence, my third book. And I thought, oh, God, this really would be a much better screenplay than a book. So it's, it's funny what, what you kind of discover. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I kind of write the, the novel. That's the bit that I'm most excited about. You've got the, the interior voices and the thoughts and the feelings and things that aren't said. When you're talking about interior voices, do they, do they come to you at night and you've got like a paper pad or you just yeah I used to have a pad you know where you pull out the pen and it lights up and you can write and because that was happening to me all the time and now of course you've got an iPhone so you can just stick you can just kind of write your notes type them in which is great much easier but if I get a really good idea or I think it's a good idea then I have to get up and come to my study and type so yeah it always always strikes me just as I'm about to fall asleep suddenly I go oh that's what I need to do has technology made it so that you're right at certain times or has it changed? Right. Um, I think I tend to do most of the initial stuff by hand. So I do it on a notebook and I'll go you know, to a cafe or I'll go to different places. But by the time I'm actually writing drafts, I'm at my desk with my computer and it's it's you know, 12 hours a day, that kind of thing. So it, it really changes how depending on what stage of the novel I'm at. Are there any kind of local places that you go in? When you start in a book that you like to be, like to enjoy, yeah, I, I I do like a cafe. I, I like the hubbub of people around. It stops me feeling too much in my head. I find it rather nice, and then somehow that stops me getting too anxious about coming up with the perfect idea. And I, I tend to write more. Um, uh, are you influenced by the people in the cafe at all in any of your books? They... Oh, suddenly they pop up in my book. No, yeah. I always hope I am. I kind of look at people thinking, are you going to inspire me to be a character? So far, that hasn't happened. The tube is much better. Quite often, I'll see someone on the tube and I think, oh, because you imagine a whole life for them for, and they completely yeah. have nothing to do with what their real life is. But you do sometimes get that. Yeah, tubes for me are quite good. Is Is there any kind of film that where, uh, that you've um, seen that you would um, have been influenced by with any of your books? No, there haven't actually. I mean, that's quite an interesting question, but there really haven't been. Um, I mean, I think if I still script writing, there would be, but I think novel writing is so different. I think, um, you know, maybe three hours I look at, what was it called, 24? That, that, yeah. That, that's... you know, I, I do like that ticking clock you know, I like that in three hours. I mean, it was hellish to plot, but, you know, you've got this three hour, you've got a deadline you know, ticking down. The police officer has to solve this by a certain point. 
And I think there's an intrinsic drama of that and the sense of time passing too quickly um, is, is kind of fascinating to me. So I, I think maybe 24. Yeah. Um, when, when, when looking at that kind of tight structure, do you think it'll, do you think it'll do it again or do you think it's just going to be a one-off tight structure? I'm not, I'm, sure. Sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it was really hard, but at the end, I think it made it much better having a very tight structure. So if I can face doing it again, I probably would. Yeah, because I know people like Jeffrey Beaver started with, started with that type structure and started their career off. So yeah, that's just interesting to see what yeah. you do. Um, oh, um, thanks so much for coming and joining us this evening. Um, I, I can't um, think of much much more to ask you without giving a lot of the much more <laughs> lot away. So. I'll just say, um, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I'll just say to um, the group that I, I have got um, next week, uh, I'll just get their assistant to have a look. <laughs> Who we've got next week? And I'll just. No, it's not. Lucy Atkins. Lucy Atkins next week. Next Monday. Um, thanks so much for. Uh, this evening, um, I really enjoyed the book, and I'll be really, really interested to see what your next one is. Too. Thank you.